All right. So I just wanted to now just sort of briefly mention some of the four main processes in, M in MI that you guys may have come across recently. It's a relatively sort of new development in this stuff. And really the first step is like you were saying over there before, and that is um, engagement necessarily comes first. And this is the bit that I'm actually going to focus a bit on today, because I think one of the key pieces of the difficult conversation is to have the engagement, to have things like the trust and other things in place that make those difficult conversations you know, much, much more able to be broached. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit too today about focusing because there will be times when there are particular things that could or should or need to be focused on and how we can guide some of that as well as be guided by the client themselves. And then really starting to evoke, asking questions and trying to evoke specific kinds of language from the person about um, you know, this idea of engagement and, and um, participation in programs and action and taking steps and, and all that sort of stuff. We want to get them kind of convincing us <coughs> rather than us convincing them. And finally planning. You know, planning logically comes last in a way. And once we've engaged the person, focused in on a target, started to evoke from them the reasons for change around that target, we then start to plan how to do it. Um, the interesting thing though is that these are kind of also potentially all used throughout. I mean, in many ways, the engaging really has to happen throughout a conversation. And sometimes we might even kind of go a bit in the wrong direction, create a bit of discord. We need to refocus on actually connecting with that person. And the focusing or the focus may change. As people are going along, they might sort of shift focus. They were all about work at the start, but having now talked about it, well, maybe there is something about um, you know, my family and spending time with them that I'd like to focus on instead. And evoking might happen at any time as well. You know, we, we might start to ask questions about the person's own view of their situation. And, the, and finally, with planning, as often when we start to make plans, set goals, try to have an action plan in place, the way that the client reacts to that gives us important feedback about whether, to, whether they're ready for that, whether we need to go back a little bit and, and sort of build more confidence or whatever it might be or whether we're ready to move forward. So what we're going to do to start with is really to um, elaborate a bit more on engagement. It's what we know most about, it relates mainly to the MI spirit. So for those of you who've come across more about motivation, I mean, the MI spirit is, is kind of to do with the relationship context, how we kind of relate to people. Not so much what we say and that sort of thing necessarily, but um, the relationship that we create. It's also a lot to do with reflective listening. And we're going to try and have a little bit of focus on that in a moment as well. But it's the importance of the spirit. It's the importance of the therapeutic relationship, compassion, non-judgment, acceptance uh, on engagement. Is engagement just about being nice to people? No. It's a, it, what are some other words that come to mind for you in terms of engagement? Being genuine. Genuineness. Okay, yeah, that's good. Listening. Listening? Yes. Kind of listening rather than sort of telling or convincing. Yeah. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you a little demonstration of engagement but a slightly different one. Have you guys come across Monty Roberts, the horse whisperer? Basically, what I'd like you to do here is just to watch this little video. Watch how Monty is engaging the horse and listen to him because he's got this commentary along the way that he's talking about what he's doing and what's happening. And a lot of it really applies to how we you know, engage and relate to our clients as well. So if you wouldn't mind just jotting down little phrases, little ideas that really speak to this idea of engagement. What did you think? What did you notice in what Monty was sort of trying to do there? Anything stand out? Body language. Body language of? I mean, he, between him and the horse, it changed as the course of the process went on. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's interesting, isn't it? Because it's the same for us. Our conversation sort of shifts too, doesn't it, as time goes. At the start, 
we might be much more about just rolling with resistance or we might be more about expressing empathy and being very sort of gentle and standing back and then a little bit later we might be much more guiding and asking particular questions that help sort of move towards some sort of action planning. Um, the behaviour or the the things that we say as clinicians are really important too, just as the, the things that the client might say. And he mentioned looking out for, you know, there's the conversation or whatever, the licking and chewing and all that. We're listening out for certain types of conversation too, which we'll elaborate on. Other things you noticed there? Bigger pardon? So know that's going to change, it's a process. Yeah. It might get anger now, it might be confused the next moment, it might come to yeah. being understanding and make a copy Yes, the, the, the um, ability for the clinician to go with the changes in the client, the, they go through various emotions, <coughs> and he was showing that compassion, wasn't he? The compassion to kind of accept the, the horse and what she was going through. You know, he said that it, you know, this is all new for her. It, she's having to acclimatise and putting a little bit of time to just allow that, you know, getting familiarity seemed important. Yeah. Anything else? He stayed the same distance, he stayed the same distance from the horse throughout until the horse gave signs that it was ready to approach. And then he actually increased his distance marginally um, to allow that to happen. Yeah. 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 Yes, we, we don't want to pursue them on this. We don't want to pursue our clients and getting, getting them to sort of making them talk about something. We want to kind of be, you know, pique their curiosity and, and sort of draw them into being motivated themselves to talk about this. And when they bring it up to us, then that's a little bit like that moment of join up where they, they've actually come to that conversation themselves. Sometimes we walk away from certain topics um, respecting the choice of the client not to talk about it and then for them to follow us up about it later. Anything else you noticed? Calm and encouraging. Calm, encouraging, affirming, super good girl, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, trying to be affirming and, and sort of build that kind of confidence and trust that way as well. Yep. to increase the distance rather than going further and yeah. uh, risk the relationship, which yep. is ultimately what you do if you apply too much pressure. Yeah. At a time when people feel vulnerable and aren't ready for it, and then people yeah. come up yeah. and yeah. He sort of said, the, you know, the horse is a flight animal and so we'll look for any opportunity to flee. And our clients are a little bit like that in that they're scared too and if they sense something, they'll, uh, ah, aha, yeah, th that's right, they, I knew they were going to say that, I'm getting out of here type thing and I'm not coming back. Um, so yeah, we're wanting to be very measured with, with how we approach them like that. And he sort of said, the last thing we want to do is to cause pain. Um, and I think that's critical as well. What, what do you think would be a, a kind of a type of pain that, that we're really wanting to avoid with humans? Loss of hope? Oh, that's interesting, yeah. The other one for me is a sense of shame. You know, that if we, the last thing we want to do is, is to shame people or to have people feel badly about themselves because of what they have or haven't done and, and that sort of thing. So the MI spirit, um, it's really about partnership. Some, I think someone mentioned the word collaboration before, working together, not being so much um, the expert kind of telling them what to do, but instead working together on this problem. Both parties having something to offer that process. Secondly, it is about evocation. We do want to be asking. We want to be curious. We want to be asking questions. We want to get the person telling us about, you know, this, this decision that they're going to make. Ask, not tell is, a, is kind of a, a kind of catch cry there. Thirdly, acceptance, respect, respecting choices, um, supporting autonomy. And I think for me that was probably the standout one with respect to the kind of clients or patients that we're talking about here is how can we support their autonomy? How can we do things that help them 
to feel able and willing and confident to make certain decisions and to take certain actions and to, to feel empowered in that sense to, to do all of that because it probably is easy to, to feel a little bit like you know, there's not much I can do and, and to get into a more passive role. And finally, compassion, non-judgment, being able to understand, listen and hear and understand what the person is actually going through. These are just things that I sort of made up and, and you, you might word them slightly differently, but these are examples of things you might say uh, that, that try to tap into that spirit. I'm hoping we can work together on what happens next for you. Making that quite explicit that this is a collaboration. Would you mind if I ask a bit about or if I talk a little bit about something or other? Gaining permission uh, before offering advice, gaining permission before broaching difficult conversations. It's really important to me that any steps you take from here are your choice. Respecting the choices and, and really supporting that, that autonomy and, and so on in terms of their choices. How much would you like to know about your condition or the rehabilitation options or whatever? So that's that point we, you raised earlier about checking in with people in terms of what they actually do want to know. And it's really important that you get a chance to feel properly listened to and under, uh, listened to. Um, you're going through a lot type of thing. That's the, that's the compassion piece as well. So often it's nice to just come up with little ways that you can express these elements of the spirit to really create that sense of engagement from the start. The other piece of this puzzle in terms of engagement is, is the reflective listening, is being able to um, sometimes even kind of slow down and just start to listen. Uh, listen and express empathy and the, the funny thing about that for me often is that when you slow down and listen it actually in the end helps to speed things up <laughs> because it's it's when the person really feels heard and understood it's when they kind of have this sense this person gets me that they're able to stop talking about that piece and move on to the next bit or whatever it might be people will keep banging on about something until they feel heard and understood about that. So sometimes slowing it down and doing this reflective listening ends up speeding things up. But it's, it's stuff you will know well. Open questions. We, we really want to ask open questions. We, we don't want to sort of tell people what they should do or try to convince them. We want to ask open questions. We want to be evocative. We want to help them to tell us and maybe even convince us of what they're going to do. And we do want to avoid those yes, no questions trying to not ask the, the closed questions because the, the problem there is often we get caught in a trap. We get caught in that question answer trap where we ask a closed question, they kind of give us a bit of a yes no answer and then we have to quickly think of another closed question to ask and then they give us a yes no answer and suddenly we're stuck in this, tra in this little trap. So we're wanting to do open questions. Secondly, as someone mentioned, we're wanting to, to do affirmations. We wanted to listen to people in a way that we can sort of identify what their strengths are. We can, we can hear in between the lines of what they say, that there are certain strengths or qualities that they can bring to bear with this next challenge. So maybe it's courage or maybe it's loyalty or maybe it's um, you know, kind of persistence or whatever. But we're listening out for these little things to affirm. Thirdly, reflections. As we're listening to them, we want to try and sort of think to ourselves, what might this person really be feeling right now and what might they be meaning? So we're trying to reflect to them some of our hunches about their feelings and, their, and the meaning behind what they're saying. And finally, summaries. Collecting people's own arguments for change into little, little, little summaries and, and sort of offering those back to them as well every so often. If you wouldn't mind getting your pen and papers ready, um, because what I was going to get, do is I'm going to read you a series of client statements. What I'd like you to do is after each statement just have a think. How could you reflect some of the feeling that's in that statement, some of the meaning behind that statement? How could you do a nice little reflection or paraphrase? We'll go through a few little client statements that you can write down your own reflections and then I'm going to ask you what sort of qualities in amongst all that the client has just said, could you affirm? What are some of this person's strengths or qualities? Then I'm going to get you to kind of summarise what they've said and then work out an open question from there. Where would you take this conversation from that moment by an open question, via an open question? I really don't know what all this is going to mean. I look ahead and all I see is a big question mark. What if things get worse and worse? Second question, a uh, second statement from the client. I know I need to do these exercises, but I don't see any change. I just don't think they're doing me any good. They seem pointless. 
I know I need to do these exercises, but I don't see any change. I just don't think they are doing me any good. They seem pointless. Third one, my wife has to do everything now. She cooks and cleans. She even has to help me get dressed. And she does all the driving now. I always did the driving. My wife has to do everything now. She cooks and cleans. She even has to help me get dressed. And she does the, all the driving now. I always did the driving. I'm worried about my marriage. My wife is like my carer now. She looks at me differently. I know she feels differently about me now. And the last one, I'm not the man I was. I don't feel like much of a man at all anymore. There are pieces to the relationship that feel really tough and maybe lost forever. All right. Now have a think, when you've listened to those statements, what sorts of qualities can you draw out of that? What sorts of words come to mind, and you can write this down now as well, where you could affirm certain strengths or certain qualities that come out of what that guy's just been telling you about? Have a think about qualities to affirm. Next, pull it all together, sum it all up. How would you kind of pull that together into a kind of a, what we call a transitional summary whereby you are able to pull together all that he said ready to sort of take the conversation somewhere, somewhere else, somewhere next. What, how would you summarise all that he said there? Just in a, a little paragraph. And then finally, where would you like to go next with this conversation? What's an open question? that you would ask next to start, you know, to sort of move the conversation forward from here. Where would you like to guide this conversation from now? As mean as this might sound, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying all the furrowed brows and the, <laughs> the, the sort of the pondering of this stuff. Uh, because this is actually, it's funny, you know, when you watch someone doing MI in particular, yeah, it kind of looks like they're sitting there, not saying much. Every now and then they'll say, you know, something back to the client that they've just said to them or whatever. But there's a lot going on up here. And you just experienced that up then, I think, just watching you, that we're having to be really quite purposeful in our listening and what we want to reflect back because that's going to be the thing that does guide the conversation. And, and in many ways, this is what we're going to try to hone is this idea of you, you might ask an open question. They might say something. You, you offer a couple of reflections along the way. At some point you might put in a little affirmation about a strength that you've heard or something that, that you've noticed. And then at another point you might try to sum it all up and give them a bit of a sense of all that they've just told you and then ask another question. That's a big, big, uh, you know, in many ways that's what we're, what we're doing with this, with this MI is we're just rolling through with that kind of um, process. So. I really don't know what all this is going to mean. I look ahead and all I see is a big question mark. And what if things get worse and worse? Anyone give me an example of a reflection that you would offer there? You're worried about what the future might hold? You're really worried about what the future might hold. That's really good because it's, it's to do with um, you're offering there a hunch about feeling. He didn't really kind of literally say that, but it's, it's about worry. And so you're doing a, a, a sort of an empathic reflection of, of that feeling that's in amongst it. That's great. Did anyone else want to give an example? Yeah? You seem to be, um, you seem to be feeling uncertain and trapped at present. Oh, nice, yeah. Sometimes within a reflection we can just sort of capture something in a word, you know, and, and that can mean a lot for people. Yeah, trapped, that's exactly how I feel, is sometimes what the reaction that you'll get. So yeah, we're, we're, we're taking a little risk there, aren't we? Because it's, it's nothing really what they said, but that's how it may be, that's our hunch. So we take this little risk, we put that out there and see where they go with that. I know I need to do these exercises, but I don't see any change. I just don't think they're any, doing me any good. They seem pointless. How would you reflect that one? You can't see the benefit of the exercises so far. Nice, yeah. You can't see the benefit of the exercises so far does two things. One is it really you know, accepts the fact that that's what they're saying. It's not pushing back against that. It's not kind of trying to create any sort of resistance in them from that. And it's putting this slight little reframe so far, you know, that to, to date it hasn't happened. 
Maybe it could in the future or maybe not, but so far that hasn't happened. Okay, that's good. Another example of a reflection there? You sound a bit frustrated. You're not seeing any quick improvement. You're sounding a bit frustrated. You're not <laughs> seeing any quick improvement. Yeah. See, that's nice too because you say to them, you, you're really not seeing any quick improvement. And then, you know, I, I, I think times that I can think of where I've said something like that, they'll say something like, well, I know it's not meant to be quick. I know there's no quick fix to this. Da, 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 da. You know, and and that creates a different direction. Yeah. What's that? Nicely and gently telling them the journey they have come through. Like after six months, eight months, they, they still they keep saying, oh, you've not achieved anything. What have I done? Nothing is. So just letting them know. Quite often they forget. So we letting them just go back to where they were at the time of admission and how far they have come. And then making them realize that they have made progress. Um, and then which means they are likely to make more. The one thing I would say about that is wherever possible, still doing that evocatively. Still doing it by asking questions, still doing it by reflecting things that they say rather than trying to tell them, rather than trying to convince them. Uh, because, you know, the, the risk of trying to convince them of, where they, of how far they come is they'll go, yeah, but, the, the, you know, they'll start to argue with that. So I think that's an excellent idea and I would just add doing it evocatively, asking them first. Just on that point, how much do you challenge them? Because you can ask that in a way of, can you think of any differences from when you very first came to hospital? So sometimes when you ask those questions, they actually go, oh, yeah, you know, I couldn't move at all. But how much in this do we actually challenge? Well, one thing is I would try to ask an open question yeah. rather than that closed question. Can you is sort of a yes, no. So I would start to explore very gently, well, tell me a bit about how things were when you first got here. You know, what was it like? What did you notice? What were some of the difficulties? Where along the way did that piece of it change? What, what do you feel like you know, worked best for you in terms of that change? So it's this kind of, I think, a, there's a gentleness to that process rather than a confrontationalness. Yep. And I might just try and extrapolate a bit on the exercise. Also, I might say, what's the hardest part about the exercises for you? Um, so that might, it makes it a bit specific, but it might be that, you know, or I don't like. Oh, I doubt it. <laughs> I've never known a physio I don't like. Yeah, that are worse than them and they get a bit depressed or they might yeah. be just explorers. There might be something particular about the, you know, about that rehab setting that just putting them on or something. Just remember that we're doing these questions for, we, we have to make sure that we have a real purpose for, us, for it because if we ask what is getting in the way of the exercises, they're going to start telling us all the things that mean it's not going to happen or that it's not going to work for them. So we, we may choose to do that because we want to work out what literally is the barriers, or we may ask the opposite. You know, what, what are the bits of the exercise that have you, you actually have found the easiest or that you've actually, what sorts of things have you maybe even enjoyed in the last little while or something like that. So we just want to make sure that we know that we're asking a particular question that's going to evoke particular sorts of language from the client. That's the licking and chewing bit. I think, of the horses. You know, we want them to sort of argue that they perhaps can do this. Anyway, but that's a question. So let's get to the next thing. Um, my wife has to do everything now. She cooks and cleans. She even has to help me get dressed. And she does all the driving now. I always did the driving. How much you reflect that? You're feeling kind of guilty about the things you can't do anymore. Yeah, there's a lot of loss there, isn't there? And being able to empathise with that and accept that that would be hard is really important. So you're noticing that the roles in your relationship have changed? You've noticed that the roles in your relationship have changed. Yeah. Okay, that's good. That's just a real acknowledgement that, that, this, that there is change afoot for him. Um, I'm worried about my marriage. My wife is like my carer now. She looks at me differently. I know she feels differently about me. How would you reflect that? So, so you think your wife has different feelings and thoughts about your relationship and what that might mean? Yeah, so your wife is having different thoughts and feelings about the relationship and maybe you're worried about what that might mean. Okay, yeah. Yep. It's, a, it's a real sense of threat for him, isn't it, that, that, these, that her feelings may have changed. Finally, I'm not the man I was. I don't feel like much of a man any, at all anymore. There are pieces to the relationship that really 
are tough and may be lost forever. How would you reflect that? Yeah. Yep. It kind of was meant to be sequential. So yeah, you might do something like that where, you know, there's a lot of unknowns and you look ahead and you're not really sure where things are going to go. One of the things that really concerns you though as well is your relationship and what, what this is going to mean for that. Uh, it, around uh, loss of identity, you struggle with your loss of identity. Mm. Good. One of the thoughts, I, I put that one in there purposely because I, I was thinking that one way to raise difficult conversations is by asking a question. Another way to raise difficult conversations is by reflecting with a bit of a hunch. So in this case, one of the, I don't know if anyone sort of thought of this as well, but, but one reflection here might be something like, um, you, you know, you, you're really concerned about the changes in your relationship, everything from just the day to day, and, and maybe also some of the elements of you know, the intimacy and the closeness with your wife. They didn't say anything about that, but he did say something along the lines of, you know, there are pieces to the relationship that, you know, kind of are lost. So I think it's, I just wanted to plant that seed for you that not always does a difficult conversation have to be raised by a, a sort of a out of the blue question. You know, oh, by the way, how's your sex life? You know, like you don't necessarily have to do it like that. It might even come up in a reflection. Sounds like um, you're worried about your intimacy with your wife or, or sometimes you feel so hopeless and dark that you, know, you kind of even wonder about whether you want to live or you know, you, you're doing a reflection but you're bringing up these difficult topics. I don't know. What, what do you think about that? You would also given the clue before because you said that she was maybe taking on that carer role and yeah. seeing her differently. So I think they do that. They, they give you these little clues, little things that we try, don't want to miss because they give us sort of a way in to talk about some of the, the important but yet difficult topics. Um, what qualities would you affirm in this guy? What did you notice about him, just listening to the sorts of things he was saying there? I think his honesty. Honesty, honesty. yep. Just across the board with each statement, yeah. I think that that's something you should be proud of, that yeah. actually admit those things openly to a relative stranger, I suppose. Yeah. I really appreciate your honesty. You know, you, you, you're obviously a very honest person, and I'm, and I'm sure that holds you in really good stead in terms of your relationship too. And so that's a good example where the quality that you might observe may, in fact, be really important in terms of this challenge that he faces with perhaps his relationship. Other qualities you would affirm? His awareness or his willingness to accept the yeah, so his awareness or insight or the clever way that he's sort of trying to kind of understand his situation. Yeah. I think he's sort of, he's um, showing he's a bit sensitive and intuitive to how things have changed for his wife. That's nice too, yeah. He's sensitive, intuitive, he's sort of empathic himself about his wife and how this might kind of also be for her. So, yeah, I think this is a good example whereby we, we, we sort of need a bit of a vocabulary, a vocabulary of strengths, a vocabulary of qualities, because we want to be able to kind of notice it and then put it into a word, you know, capture it with, you know, honesty or um, sensitivity or courage or whatever it might be. We want to sort of have a bit of a, a vocab to draw on to offer these qualities so that the person's sort of thinking, well, yeah, I, I guess I am kind of intuitive. I guess I... I do care about how my wife's feeling and I, I really put a lot of effort into understanding where she's coming from or whatever it might be. It, the, the affirmation is very much about them being able to take that idea away and see it as part of themselves. Would anyone give me an example of your transitional summary? How did you sum it all up with this guy? Please. Um, and you're worried about what the future might hold and you're feeling like you're not contributing as much as you'd like to family life and you feel a sense of loss about some aspects of your life with your wife, particularly intimacy. Ah, you did that thing. Yeah, you did the thing where you introduced the piece of intimacy in the summary as opposed to the reflection. But yeah, that's really nice. Um, and uh, that's, I mean, that's very much a, a kind of expressing empathy summary where you're just really being very accepting 
of, of the various challenges and things that he's, he's described to you. Great. Did anyone have a different sort of summary that they would share? You want to. Uh, it sounds like you want to change your approach to re-energise your relationship and rehabilitation. Ooh, yes, that is a different summary. You know, yeah, it sounds like you kind of want to change something in your approach to both your re relationship and to your rehabilitation. Yeah, because you've sort of sent something there that he's just not satisfied with how things are going. He's not literally saying he's ready to change, but you're willing to plant that seed in the summary a little bit. Okay, good. One other summary? Um, yeah. Uh, sorry, but you could, um, I can see that a lot of your questions are, are based around your relationship. Um, and uh, no wonder the exercises uh, seem pointless if that's not his primary concern, if that's not your primary concern. Yeah, that's nice as well. So you're sort of saying um, a lot of what you're talking about is your relationship and your concerns there. And, and kind of in comparison to that, the exercise does seem a little bit sort of pointless to you because that, it's the relationship that's of main concern. There may be other elements to the exercise that, that you kind of wondering about or curious about too. Um, on the other hand, the relationship is most important at the moment. Yeah. So what's the transitional question? What's an open question that you might ask next in terms of guiding this conversation? What, what would you like to ask him about next? What does your wife think about all of this? What does your wife think about all this? It's interesting. Tapping into his sort of sensitivities around her and how she's experiencing things. Yeah, good. Anything else? I wonder if there's a role he might be to take back. If there's something you can do with your wife that would be just something you used to do. Something yeah. small that you'd like to be able to do again around. So you could start with a kind of a sort of a goal setting type uh, question, you know what? Maybe trying to do it in an open way, but, but yeah, so you know, what, when you think of all of these different bits that have changed in your life, what, what would you see as a priority in terms of trying to take back a, a role or responsibility in the home? Yep. One more question? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so really just broadening it out and saying, you know, like, there's a lot going on for you. What, what would you like us to even focus on today? What, what would be most helpful for you for us to go on to talk about today? So a really open question that, that he can take anywhere. I think that's good. I think, again, we're wanting to, to be quite purposeful. Sometimes we want to just ask very broad questions because we want to hand that, that over to them and it's up to them. Other times we might ask a particularly you know, a bit more open question but still more focused because that's the topic that we're really needing to address today for, for whatever reason for them or whatever. All right. Any thoughts about that? How, how was that? Was that sort of easy or hard? How did you find those reflections, those summaries? a lot going on yeah 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 that's why that's why I've called it in the moment because you know when you're there with a the client it is in the moment you've got to kind of reflect or affirm or ask a question in a way that a lot of things have been considered before you actually open your mouth yeah any other thoughts like that Yeah. And reaffirming and yeah. reflecting, it's very difficult. Takes patience, mm. takes kind of a bit of silence, um, attention. Mm. Yes, we're wanting to try to remember what they say. 
<laughs> God forbid. Um, yeah, it's a, it, it, although have a listen to yourself next time you are in the coffee shop because you may find that you do do a lot of these things with them too. You know, you probably do reflect, gee, you must have felt really upset about that or really frustrated in that moment. Or you, you probably are doing a lot of this there as well. In fact, sometimes that clinical assessment interrogation mode is something we do more at work than, you know, in our personal lives. All right, so that's this first bit. So we're, I'm really putting to you now that for, for the sake of these more difficult or challenging conversations, we're really wanting to engage the person and put time, a little bit of time, into the engagement, building a relationship that, that's trusting and safe um, and, you know, with the MI spirit and so on.